Audiobook titled DC Phantom Thief Kid, 36-41, by Sithosk. This work belongs to author Sithosk. Source Scribblehub.com. Chapter 36, Bad Girl. Never forget what you are. The rest of the world will not. Tyrion Lannister got. Meanwhile, in Wayne Manor's underground, the Batcave, Dick walked in with Alfred through a secret entrance with bags. They were surprised to find someone already in the Batcave. But this person wasn't tall, or even male. Clearly, it wasn't Batman who had returned. It was a young red-haired girl wearing a bat-themed helmet and a tight-fitting black suit with a bat symbol on her chest. She was looking for some information while she sat in front of the huge bat computer. In some ways, she looked more like Batman's partner than the red, green, and yellow-cloaked Robin. She was Batgirl, the new street hero who recently appeared in Gotham as the fourth member of the Bat family. To be honest, she didn't really like the name Batgirl. She wanted to be called Batwoman, even though she had just turned 18 two months ago. But for some reason, when she first appeared in the newspaper, the media called her Batgirl. Hey Alfred, and little elf boots, you're back. Seeing that Alfred and Dick had returned, Batgirl greeted them. Hey, we agreed not to call me elf boots. Dick was not happy with the nickname Batgirl used to call him, and he twitched. Is that so? I don't remember making any agreements with anyone. Maybe when you finally change those childish green boots, I'll think about it. Batgirl spread her hands and said it with a smirk. Everyone in the circus wears these boots. I'm not changing them. Well, yeah, the shape is kind of funny, but that's its charm. Dick raised an eyebrow. I'm glad to see you, Miss Gordon. Alfred smiled and said to Batgirl, If the GCPD heard his name, they would definitely look at Batgirl carefully because their respected commissioner's last name was Gordon. Moreover, Commissioner Gordon also had a daughter who had recently turned 18, the same age as Batgirl. That's right, Batgirl's real identity was none other than Commissioner Gordon's daughter Barbara Gordon. It seems like you two have been busy today. Would you like some late night dinner? Looking at the thick files in the bat computer in front of Bacco, it was obvious that he would have to work for a long time, so Alfred suggested. Thank you so much, Alfred. Because of some jerk, I didn't even have time for dinner, and now I'm starving. A surprised expression appeared on Bacco's face, and she said gratefully, No need to thank me. It's my pleasure. Alfred turned and headed towards the kitchen to prepare some food and coffee for Batgirl and Dick. Meanwhile, Dick placed the bag in a corner against the wall. There was a huge cabinet there with hundreds of small glass cases, each one protected by ultra-strong glass. In the cabinet, there are many items stored, all of which are strange and rare things. There were two-faced coins, Riddler's cane, Killer Croc's teeth, Scarecrow's mask, Harley Quinn's baseball bat, and many more. These are all items that Batman and Robin have collected from different enemies. Most of them were collected due to some strange collecting addiction, and a small number of special items were put into the GCPD evidence room because they were more dangerous. Batman couldn't trust others to keep them safe, so he took them back himself. Dick took out a white cloak from his handbag and placed it in an empty cabinet case. Batgirl noticed his actions and asked curiously, I heard you've been having a heated battle with that popular phantom thief recently. Is this his cloak? What a strange word you used. Dick couldn't help but comment. I just heard from Alfred that you seem to have a good impression of phantom thief. Aren't you afraid Batman will get angry if he finds out? Batgirl shrugged. You know he never likes us to judge criminals based on personal feelings. Ha ha. Dick gave a strange laugh. I used to believe that too until I learned about his history with Catwoman. Batgirl was amused by what Dick said. You know what? I totally agree with you, but... Batgirl then turned to the back computer, facing away from Dick. I can actually understand why Bruce would always be soft on Catwoman, especially after seeing her in person once. Wow, she's a smoking hot beauty. As for Phantom Thief, the more he listened, the more uneasy Dick felt. He crossed his arms over his chest, and his face grew serious. What do you mean? Nothing. I'm just thinking, if I told your girlfriend at the Titan Tower about this, would she believe it? Batko smirked, making Dick's eyelids twitch. I'm just kidding. Don't take it seriously. By the way, did you run into any troublemakers today? Need my help? Dick asked suddenly. No need, I can handle it by myself. Honestly, I'm more worried if you need my help dealing with Phantom Thief. Batgirl turned her head to look at the back computer and said with her back to Dick. You've faced him twice already and still got no useful information. His real name, age, appearance, job, and life history are all blank. 
there's already one file on him in the back computer's database, and we don't need a second one, Batgirl said. That's because you haven't fought Phantom Thief yourself. If you have, you'll know how difficult he is to deal with. Dick folded his hands on his chest, with a serious face, and said, He is very smart, maybe not as smart as Riddler, but he also doesn't have the obsessive-compulsive disorder that the Riddler likes to leave clues for the enemy. It's hard to figure out Phantom Thief's plans. Also, Phantom Thief's disguising techniques are very clever. If it weren't for the fact that I saw him tearing off the disguised mask of William with my own eyes, I might have thought he had shape-shifting powers like Clayface. Dick explained. But Phantom Thief's acting is even better than Clayface. Unless you know every small detail of the person and can see his flaws, it's impossible to directly recognize his disguise. Phantom Thief is very cautious and knows all about the police's arrangements and monitoring systems. He doesn't leave any trace and can even avoid all the surrounding surveillance. Dick continued. The only clue we have is that Phantom Thief's identity might be a magician, but there are too many magicians in Gotham, and we don't even know his age. So it's impossible to identify him. Dick shook his head with a bitter smile. I once asked a professional magician to help investigate Phantom Thief's suspects based on his magical skills, and then I got 20 candidates. But after checking them one by one, I found that none of them could be Phantom Thief. Batgirl slowly became interested as she listened to Dick's description. Is it really that difficult to deal with this Phantom Thief as you say? Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 8. Chapter 37 Gotham City Public Library Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while you can miss it. Ferris Bueller Believe me, if you've seen Phantom Thief once, you'll know that I'm not making things up. Dick said this seriously to Batgirl. Are you sure? You can handle it alone? You don't need my help? Batgirl asked with a questioning look. I told you I don't need your help. Can we stop talking about Phantom Thief for a moment? What are you investigating right now? Dick changed the subject. He walked over to Batgirl and looked at the huge screen of the Bat computer. Let me see. Garfield Linz. Firefly? Seeing the name displayed in the Bat file, Dick asked in surprise. Yeah, remember when he and that stupid killer moth set fire to the GCPD headquarters. It was me who clearly defeated the two of them. But in the end, the newspaper said it was you and Batman who did it. Hearing this, Dick smiled awkwardly and said, Um, you know, in our line of work, we shouldn't care about fame and credit. As long as the bad guys are stopped, it doesn't matter who did it, right? In fact, it wasn't about Dick and Batman taking credit away from Batgirl that day. Even though Batgirl had already taken down Killer Moth and Firefly by the time they got there, she wasn't in good shape herself at the time. So, the task of taking Firefly and Killer Moth into custody fell to Batman and Robin. Since there were no witnesses to the entire battle, the police and the media only saw Batman and Robin, and they didn't even know what Batgirl had done. With Batman's personality, he wouldn't go out of his way to tell anyone that Batgirl actually caught the criminals. Suit yourself. Batgirl replied calmly. Cough, cough. Dick coughed twice and curiously asked, After that incident, didn't Firefly and Killer Moth get sent to Arkham Asylum? Why are you digging into their old files again? A few weeks ago, a district attorney proposed to reopen the GCPD arson case. He thinks that the psychological analyses of Firefly and Killer Moth aren't clear enough, and that they might have been faked. So they were preparing to transfer the two of them to Blackgate Penitentiary for imprisonment. Batgirl explained. That doesn't sound like a bad thing, Dick said. I thought so too until I received some really bad news yesterday. Firefly escaped. Dick furrowed his brow tightly. How did he escape? What about Killer Moth? Who knows? When a prison guard made his morning rounds, he suddenly discovered that Firefly was missing. There were no signs, and the surveillance didn't catch anything. As for Killer Moth, he's still in prison. Maybe Firefly had a falling out with him. Batgirl shrugged helplessly. I've been tracking Firefly after hearing about this. I hacked into Gotham's entire surveillance system and found over 30 locations where he was spotted. I spent the whole day checking those places, even dealt with several criminals on the streets. I couldn't find Firefly. So, I came back to check the bat files and look through the bat files to see if I could guess the possible places he would go from Firefly's past experiences. You know, the information in the back computer is much more detailed than the GCPD's database. Dick nodded and suggested, I can help you with some of that. 
In fact, you can't, Master Richard. At this point, Alfred came over and interrupted him with two plates of chicken sandwiches and two cups of coffee. I'm sorry to have to remind you, but you still have homework to complete. Alfred is right. A young boy like you who's still in school should go and finish your assignments obediently, or else be careful of Bruce coming back to spank you. Backel said it with a sly smile. If you encounter any difficult problems that you can't solve, feel free to ask me for help, she added. Dick glanced at her and didn't argue back because he knew that he couldn't really compete with the girl in front of him when it came to studying. At 16 years old, Dick was still in his fourth year at Gotham Academy, waiting to take this year's ACT or SAT exams. While 18-year-old Batgirl had already graduated from Gotham University six months ago with a PhD in library management, grabbing a sandwich and stuffing it into his mouth, Dick went to the side to finish his schoolwork while Batgirl continued with her task. After a while, Batgirl finished reviewing all the files and stretched lazily before getting up from her chair and walking towards the Batcave's garage. I'm heading back now, see you tomorrow, Alfred and Elf Boots. Batgirl said as she hopped onto a bat cycle, said goodbye to Alfred and Dick, and then left the Batcave. The night passed without much incident. The next day, Sunday, Gotham Burnley District, Sutton Manor. When Dean woke up and got out of bed, it was already 9.30 o'clock in the morning. After getting ready, he had a simple breakfast and left the house. Dean had a very important plan to do today, so he was planning to go to Gotham City Public Library. Of course, he didn't go there to do school research. Although Dean had schoolwork just like Dick, and he hadn't even started on it yet, he wasn't worried at all. In his previous life, he could even finish summer homework in a single night with just a pen. This weekend's schoolwork was nothing to Dean. The reason he was going to the library was actually to prepare a new notice letter. It must be said that writing the notice letter was really difficult. It had to be cleverly mysterious, not too direct, but also not too much. It had to be difficult enough to decipher but also not impossible to figure out. This forced Dean to learn a lot of unknown knowledge that normal people would never bother to learn so as to have more knowledge to use when writing the notice letter. On the way... He also took care of a fake pink fantasy and threw it into a random garbage can. Arriving at the library, Dean went straight to the section on ancient religious mythology. He picked up a book with a mysterious cover and started flipping through it while standing there. As he was reading, a surprised voice suddenly came from the aisle to Dean's left. An introduction to Greco-Roman polytheism? I didn't expect anyone to be interested in that kind of book. Dean turned his head and saw a red-haired girl wearing glasses staring at him in surprise, and at the book in his hand. The girl looked a year or two older than Dean, with a tall and well-attractive figure. She was wearing a white uniform with a name tag that read Library Administrator. She was pushing a cart full of books, apparently organizing them. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to disturb you while you were reading. I was just so surprised because from the first day... I started working here until now, I've never seen anyone looking for and reading books from this section. Noticing Dean's gaze, the girl immediately realized that she might have interrupted him, and quickly apologized. Author's note, guys I think it will be Cassandra Kane or Barbara Gordon, but there's no progress yet so let's see. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 9. Chapter 38 Barbara no one notices your sadness until it turns into anger, and then you're the bad person. Unknown. Don't worry, there aren't many people coming to this library in Gotham, and even fewer people are interested in reading boring books. So it's already good that you didn't mistake me for a suspicious robber. Dean spoke calmly as he closed the book and put it back on the shelf. Besides, I was just planning to leave and get something to eat. Dean continued, realizing it was already close to 1.30 in the afternoon. So it's not really a regular mealtime. But Dean ate breakfast quite late, so he wasn't very hungry. He had been reading for a while and had lost track of time. Dean might have kept reading longer if the librarian girl hadn't spoken up just now. Is that so? Well then, I have to recommend the dining area in our library to you. I swear in my father's name that the cheese rolls they sell there are the best in all of Gotham. And the best part is that they are affordable. So, I really suggest you give it a try. The girl eagerly recommended the library's food to Dean when she heard that he was going to eat. Dean wondered if the cheese rolls were really that good, or if she was just trying to attract customers to the library. This kind of library shouldn't need help from the government to keep running, right? 
But maybe they hired someone else to run the dining area, or they just wanted to make a little extra money. However, he didn't bother thinking too much about it. He dismissed these meaningless thoughts, as he wasn't interested in such matters. If the police commissioner's daughter highly recommends the food, then it can't be that bad. In that case, let me go and try it. Dean said as he got up and headed towards the dining area in the library. Wait, what did you say just now? The librarian girl hurriedly grabbed Dean and asked in shock. Do you know me? No, this is our first meeting. Then how do you know my identity? The girl looked at Dean suspiciously. It's simple. The requirements for hiring librarians at Gotham City Public Library are much higher than in regular libraries, and employees can enjoy government benefits. Unless you have studied library management in college or have parents who are public servants, it's rare for someone to qualify for a formal position here. Additionally, the color of your employee badge is dark blue, which means you have a higher rank than other librarians here. Dean explained it naturally. It is impossible for ordinary people at your age to get this position. But what does that have to do with being the police commissioner's daughter? Can't I be the daughter of any government official? The girl asked with suspicion. Dean smiled faintly and replied, In Gotham, officials are usually not very clean. Their children would not be interested in a low-paying job like being a librarian, which has many benefits, but an extremely low salary. It is even more impossible for them to endure the hardship of practicing martial arts all year round. You, on the other hand, have a different background. You have trained in martial arts, maybe judo or karate. This can be seen in the calluses on your hands and the tight muscles on your legs. That type of physique is different from someone who just works out. It's developed from years of hard work and hitting hard objects. It shows that you are very focused and have been practicing for a long time. Unlike those rich second generations who take martial arts classes, they usually do it for fun and wouldn't achieve the same level of body as you. Dean continued, especially in the world of DC Comics, if any wealthy or official second generation member seriously learns martial arts, it's 100% sure that they will become a vigilante or superhero. But there aren't many superheroes, so seeing one is not something you can see every day. With the environment in Gotham, it's rare for families to send their daughters to learn combat techniques systematically. Those who are often focused on the political and legal systems, like police officers, lawyers, and judges, have a better understanding of the city's hidden darkness than ordinary people. They are also wealthier than ordinary families, so they would want you to have the power to protect yourself. After all, they can't keep their daughters at home forever. As the conversation went on, the girl's interest was slowly aroused. According to what you said, even if my parents possibly work in the political and legal system, why do you think it's Commissioner Gordon? There are other police officers who have daughters as well. The girl asked with curiosity. Well, that's where my friend comes in. He has a lot of sources of information and once told me about Commissioner Gordon's genius daughter who graduated from Gotham University with a doctorate in library management at the age of 18. It is obvious that it is you. Dean shrugged, raising an eyebrow. He wasn't lying. This friend was actually Dick, and they had known each other for many years and often talked about things they knew. Dick always complained to Dean about the corruption among the city's high-ranking officials, while Dean would reveal some secrets of magic to Dick. Dick had mentioned Commissioner Gordon's daughter during one of these discussions, but Dean hadn't paid much attention to it, and he didn't know that Barbara was Batgirl. The girl fell silent for a moment and said, So, you actually knew that my father is Jim Gordon, and everything you said earlier was just nonsense? Dean smiled slightly and said, Why call it nonsense? Did I say something wrong? Okay, fine. Your observation skills are amazing. You should become a private detective. I'm Barbara Gordon. May I ask what your name is? Barbara introduced herself officially and then asked for Dean's name. Nice to meet you, Ms. Gordon. I'm Dean Sutton, and this is a little gift for our first meeting. Dean stretched out his hand and snapped his fingers, and a pink rose appeared out of thin air. He slightly bowed and handed the flower to Barbara. Oh, thank you. You can do magic tricks as well? Barbara graciously accepted the rose, slightly surprised. Conjuring a rose is not a rare technique. It can be considered a basic skill that every magician knows. But because of this, it is harder to do it, especially in front of an audience with sharp eyes. Batgirl's eyesight clearly fell into the category of excellent eyesight. Barbara could see through most close-up magic tricks at a glance. But when Dean conjured the rose just now, Barbara couldn't understand his technique at all. It's not that she didn't understand, 
but that she couldn't see it. Barbara knew the method behind this magic trick, and she could even perform it successfully herself. But it was basically impossible to do it, to the level that Dean's trick cannot be seen at all. But Dean doesn't know that Barbara is Batgirl because there are too many Batgirl versions of DC Comics, like Betty Kane, Cassandra Kane, Stephanie Brown and more. Now that I think about it, I seem to have heard the name Sutton somewhere before. I remember now. You're the famous young prodigy magician. Barbara suddenly seemed to recall something. Grayson mentioned you before. Wait a minute, you said your friend told you about Commissioner Gordon's daughter? Could it be? Yes, you guessed right. My friend is Dick Grayson. Dean admitted it frankly. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 7. Chapter 39. Dragon's Egg Ruby Necklace. If you don't share someone's pain, you can never understand them. Nagato, Naruto. Gotham City Public Library, Dining Area. It's hard to imagine why a library would have a dining area. Who would be hungry while reading here? It is very common for a library and a coffee shop to be together, as it's more in line with the normal habit of reading and having coffee at the same time. When Dean first entered the dining area, he found the surroundings surprisingly nice. Although there weren't many customers eating here, the whole place was very clean and tidy. The decor was simple and looked like that of McDonald's. In fact, compared to a restaurant for new customers, Dean felt that this place was more like the cafeteria of the library. There were obviously more people wearing librarian uniforms than those who came to read books, which may also be the reason why the meal time has passed. At this moment, a waiter walked over with a tray of food and placed it on Dean's table. Sir, this is your order for the cheese and beef roll combo. Enjoy your meal. The combo meal consisted of two beef rolls, a serving of french fries, and a glass of freshly squeezed lemonade. The cheese beef rolls were much larger than McDonald's chicken rolls, and the whole combo meal was quite good and affordable. According to Barbara's recommendation of the food being of good quality and a reasonable price, so far it seems she was right. Thank you. Dean thanked the waiter, but instead of immediately eating, he looked at the red-haired girl sitting across the table. So, why did you come along, Ms. Gordon? Dean asked with a strange expression on his face. Aren't you supposed to be organizing all those books on the book cart? Actually, that wasn't my job in the first place. Barbara shrugged with boredom, saying, As you said, my position is one level higher than the other librarians, so my tasks are not about organizing books. Instead, I manage the librarians, even though there aren't many people for me to manage here. I pushed the cart to organize the books just now mainly because I had nothing else to do and wanted to help the other staff a bit. Barbara smirked and added, But now that I see someone more interesting than organizing books, so I came over. Wow, I'm flattered. Dean exaggeratedly replied, You probably won't believe how famous you are. When I was still a student in school, almost every female classmate dreamed of having your autographed photo. Even though I was too busy preparing for my thesis for early graduation and didn't have the time to pay attention to magic shows or anything like that, I still constantly hear your name from time to time. Barbara's face was serious. The title of Gotham's genius young magician was quite impressive. Especially when Dean had a handsome and charming face, it attracted even more young female fans. If this was the case at the Gotham University where Barbara was, it's easy to imagine how terrible it would be at the high school Dean himself was in. Dean couldn't remember how many girls wanted to date him, but he had always rejected all of them. Whenever on Valentine's Day, Dean's locker or drawers in school would be filled with piles of confession letters, flowers, and chocolates, which had always been a source of distress for him. This situation also made the boys at school generally unfriendly towards Dean, so he usually only hung out with Dick. It wasn't until Dean basically stopped performing on stage in the past two years and his reputation slowly declined that his situation improved a lot. Genius young magician? That's all in the past, just an empty reputation. There are plenty of magicians out there who are more better than me. Dean took a bite of his cheese beef roll and chewed it before swallowing. He said, like the Zatara family from Gotham City, both of them are top-notch magicians. The younger is even younger than me and he is considered the number one prodigy magician in Gotham. Eating alone can be a bit boring, so Dean started chatting with Barbara. Now that you've tried the cheese beef roll, how does it taste? Is it amazing? Barbara suddenly looked expectantly at Dean and asked. Um, it's pretty good. 
Dean was a bit unsure of how to respond to the question and pondered for a moment before giving an honest answer. Overall, the taste was good. At least Dean didn't find any issues with it. It might be slightly better than a regular cheese beef roll. As for whether it was the best cheese beef roll in Gotham, it's hard to say. After all, Dean hadn't tried rolls from other places. In short, Dean gave his ratings. I told you the recipe was good. Surprisingly, when Barbara heard Dean's response, she said excitedly, You don't know, a few days ago, the head chef decided to change the recipe for the cheese beef roll. She thought changing the flavor would attract more customers to eat, but it was a disaster. Speaking up to this point, Barbara glanced at the counter discreetly, then leaned closer to Dean and whispered, You haven't tried the other foods in the restaurant, so you don't understand, but believe me, the only thing worth eating here is this beef roll. If they really change the recipe, I'm afraid I'll have to order takeout every day. But if customers give feedback that the cheese beef roll is delicious, it could convince her not to change the current recipe. Unfortunately, very few people order this food. Luckily, you came today. Upon hearing this, Dean fell into deep thought. I don't know why, but suddenly I feel that the cheese beef roll on the plate tastes different. At the same time, the Diamond District of Gotham, an area filled with wealthy people, it is the safest part of the city. It is also the Penguin Stronghold, where the Iceberg Lounge is located. Yes, you heard it right. The place where Penguin lives is the safest part of Gotham City than the GCPD headquarters and the old Gotham District where the city government lives. Inside the Iceberg Lounge, a woman who appeared to be in her 40s, perfectly dressed from head to toe, nervously walked into Penguin's office. She wore a diamond necklace around her neck, but the diamonds were not the focus of the necklace. Instead, they played a supporting role. The real treasure was a huge oval-shaped ruby, the size of a palm, hanging from the necklace, a priceless gem. In the office, Penguin sat alone at his desk, looking at her with a smile on his face. Welcome to the Iceberg Lounge, Mrs. Chandler. What do you want from me, Oswald? Mrs. Chandler took a deep breath, mustered her courage, and coldly asked, Don't be so rude. I never asked my men to capture you. I simply had them invite you over. Penguin still maintained his smile, his gaze fixed on Mrs. Chandler's chest. I have to say, you've taken good care of yourself. I remember you're over sixty now, yet you still look so young. It seems those legends about the dragon's egg ruby necklace maintain your youth is true. Seeing Penguin's gaze focused on her necklace, Mrs. Chandler's expression immediately changed. Save it, Oswald. I will never let you take it away. You misunderstand me too deeply. I'm a businessman, not a criminal. Why would I want to take away your most beloved necklace? Penguin shook his head slightly and looked like he was ashamed. Mrs. Chandler, your necklace is one of Gotham's most famous treasures, yet it has never been publicly exhibited. So many people can only imagine what it looks like. Don't you think it's a pity? What are you trying to say? Mrs. Chandler said coldly. I just believe that the people of Gotham have the right to see this city's treasure with their own eyes. Penguin smiled lightly and kindly said, So I've decided to hold an exhibition soon, and I hope you can agree to exhibit this dragon's egg ruby necklace. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 7. Chapter 40. Breaking News. Be the change that you wish to see in the world. Mahatma Gandhi. Gotham City Public Library. Dining Area. In the middle of a casual conversation with Barbara, Dean finished his cheese beef roll combo. A news broadcast suddenly interrupted the Big Bang Theory that was currently playing on an old hanging television in the cafeteria. This is Gotham Channel 7, I'm your host, Rasai White, and we have a breaking news report. At this moment, we are interviewing in front of one of Gotham's oldest families, the current matriarch of the Chandler family, Mrs. Evelyn Chandler. Just an hour ago, Mrs. Chandler announced some exciting news. She has decided to publicly exhibit the Chandler family's heirloom, the dragon's egg ruby necklace, which has been passed down through the Chandler family for centuries. This is the first time the Chandler family has agreed to exhibit this necklace to the outside world. It is rumored that a total of 130 diamonds are placed around this necklace to set off the huge ruby hanging on it. This treasure is said to have the power to keep one forever young. Many people believe that Mrs. Chandler, who is in her 60s, looks at least 20 years younger than she looks because of wearing this necklace. It is not known whether it is true or not. Upon hearing this breaking news, Dean's heart moved, 
and he seemed to look at the TV by accident as he lifted his head. Barbara also turned her head to watch the TV, and the two of them made the same movements at the same time, although Barbara's movements were perhaps a bit faster. So this is what they mean by girls can't resist the attraction of jewelry? Dean looked at the back of Barbara's head and thought to himself. In other news, the phantom thief, who has been very active in Gotham recently has committed crimes twice in a row. Why did Mrs. Chandler decide to exhibit the dragon's egg ruby necklace at this time? Now let's switch to the live scene of the press conference. As soon as the news anchor, Risai White, finished speaking, the TV screen switched to a bustling square. There were numerous reporters surrounding Mrs. Chandler, and cameras were flashing nonstop. Mrs. Chandler, you've always been against publicly exhibiting the dragon's egg ruby necklace. What made you change your mind? A familiar blonde female reporter squeezed her way to the front row and raised her microphone to ask Mrs. Chandler. This reporter was none other than Vicky Vale. She was indeed Gotham's most famous star reporter, and she was always seen on almost every hot topic in Gotham. There's no particular reason. It's just that after growing older, I've come to realize many things that I was obsessed with in my youth. Mrs. Chandler spoke calmly. Her expression was comfortable as if these words were truly from her heart. The dragon's egg ruby necklace is not only a family heirloom but also a treasure of Gotham. While I can't go against my ancestors' wishes and donate it to a museum, I believe that all the people of Gotham have the right to see this treasure with their own eyes. So, Mrs. Chandler's eyes flashed with a hidden strangeness, but she quickly covered it up. I decided to invest with the Copperpot family to hold a grand exhibition at the Natural History Museum. The exhibition will run from March 1st to the 15th, and all tickets will be sold at a 30% discount during the exhibition. As soon as her announcement came out, the audience was in an uproar. There is nothing wrong with the exhibition, which runs for half a month, and there is nothing wrong with paying 30% off the tickets. It is not also a big problem to choose the exhibit at the Natural History Museum. However, co-sponsoring the event with the Cobblepot family was a different issue. The Cobblepot family was considered an old wealthy in Gotham and used to have a higher status than the Chandler family. Unfortunately, their former glory had long faded, and the Cobblepot family now only had Oswald Cobblepot. Everyone knew he had another identity, a chilling one, Penguin. Why would Penguin co-sponsor an exhibition with the Chandler family? Mrs. Chandler, Oswald Cobblepot is currently under investigation for alleged money laundering by authorities. Aren't you afraid of any consequences for cooperating with him? Vicky continued her questioning. Mrs. Chandler glanced at her calmly and replied, Please mind your words, Ms. Reporter. As far as I know, there's no evidence to prove Oswald's involvement in money laundering. If you continue making such careless comments, I'll have security escort you out. Well, if you insist, I apologize for my words. If I may, I have one final question for you. Seeing Mrs. Chandler's attitude, Vicky's eyes flickered, and she finally asked, Mrs. Chandler, have you heard of the The Phantom Thief? He is a notorious jewel thief who has been active in Gotham recently. Aren't you worried that he might target your necklace? I am aware of this thief, but I am not afraid. I have full confidence in the future security measures for the exhibition. Mrs. Chandler spoke with a confident expression. That's all for the news for now. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Risai White. Stay tuned for our next program, where I will report the latest news. With that, the news broadcast ended, and the TV resumed playing the Big Bang Theory in a loop. After watching the news, Dean was lost in thought. Co-sponsoring an exhibition with the Penguin? Was that some kind of century-old joke? Unless Mrs. Chandler had lost her mind, there was no way she would willingly cooperate with the Penguin. The only possibility is that Penguin is forcing her to publicly exhibit the necklace. But the question is, why would the Penguin do this? If he wants the necklace, he could just steal it or buy it directly. It's too simple for him. What good does it do Penguin to simply put a priceless ruby necklace on public display? It seems there's more to it than meets the eye. Dean silently thought to himself. Hey Dean, can I call you Dean? I suddenly remembered that I have some important work to do, so I have to go now. At this time, Barbara suddenly told Dean that she had an urgent matter and quickly disappeared. Dean noticed the anxiousness in her expression, but he didn't think much of it, especially since he also had something urgent to do himself. Meanwhile, at the Iceberg Lounge, Penguin finished watching the news on TV, and a satisfied smile appeared on his face. 
you're so sure that phantom thief will fall for it? A shadowy figure in the corner spoke, almost invisible. Humph, in Gotham, no one would fall for such a thing. But I'm sure he will come. Penguin smirked coldly and spoke with determination about his plan. It doesn't matter, as long as I take down the phantom thief, I'll get five hundred thousand dollars, right? That's all I need to know. The shadowy figure slowly disappeared. A burning phantom thief. This might turn out to be an interesting piece of work. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 6. Chapter 41. The Third Notice Letter. Next. Wayne Manor Batcave. Batco rode her bat cycle into the Batcave. Meanwhile, Alfred was discussing something with Dick. Hey, Alfred Elf Boots, it looks like I came just in time. What were you guys talking about? Barbara took off her helmet and greeted them. Welcome back, Miss Gordon. Alfred replied with his usual warm smile. Hey, Barbara, are you still investigating the Firefly's escape? Dick asked. Not for the time being. I still haven't found the location of Firefly. This is very unusual. In a city as big as Gotham, he can't move outside without leaving any clues. Someone must have hidden him. Who would have the time to hide a pyromaniac lunatic? Hearing this, Dick rubbed his chin and muttered to himself. Barbara shook her head and said, I don't have a clue yet. There are too many suspects, and it's going to take forever to find out who hid him. So, what brings you here today? Dick looked at Barbara strangely. As the daughter of the commissioner of police and a librarian, Barbara usually kept a low profile and didn't visit the Batcave unless it was necessary. Well, I saw some interesting news not long ago. Barbara told the news she had seen and added her own thoughts. Partnership with Penguin to hold an exhibition? That's a stupid idea. Even if Mrs. Chandler were really old and unstable, she wouldn't make such a decision. There must be something fishy behind this. Barbara confidently said, I think it's probably Penguin who started this. He wanted to use the exhibition to attract someone's attention. After listening to Barbara's words, Dick's expression became strange. When did you become so interested in the Phantom Thief? Didn't I tell you not to get involved in this? Dick observed Barbara warily. But last time, you said that if I the face Phantom Thief in person, I would know what he was capable of. I really want to face this Phantom Thief right now. Barbara shrugged her shoulders, raised the corners of her mouth, and said, Besides, you have already failed to catch to the Phantom Thief twice. This time Penguin is likely to make a lot of noise, I think it is necessary to give you some help. So if Phantom Thief really wants to steal the dragon's egg ruby necklace, then I will get involved. At this time, Alfred, who was next to him interrupted and said, Miss Gordon, it's great that you are willing to cooperate with Master Richard. We were discussing this matter just now. That's not for you to decide, Alfred. Barbara and I have clear and different responsibilities. And the Phantom Thief is mine. She just needs to focus on her own neighborhood. Dick said it in a hurry, curling his lips unhappily. Wow, it's so rare to see you get emotional. Where did our smart and agile wonder boy go? Barbara exaggeratedly covered her mouth and exclaimed with wide eyes. Humph. Dick snorted and turned his head away. Barbara was amazed by his reaction and turned to Alfred, saying, Alfred, do all boys in their teenage years act like this? I can imagine how difficult it must be for you. He <laughs> he. Alfred chuckled mysteriously. Sometimes, Master Richard does some things that give me a headache. But compared to Master Bruce in the past, he is already a very good behaved child. Hearing this sentence, Barbara's eyes lit up instantly, and she immediately asked, What did Bruce do before? Dick on the side still kept turning his head and sulking, but his ears visibly moved. Seeing that both kids were eager to hear old stories, Alfred began to reminisce. When Master Bruce was fifteen years old he, late at night, Chandler Manor. Unlike Wayne Manor, which appears ancient and rustic, the ancestral home of the Chandler family has been torn down and rebuilt several times over the years. It has been upgraded with the most advanced top materials, such as fireproofing, explosion proofing, and earthquake resistance, making it almost like a fortress. On the other hand, Wayne Manor remains the same old house from a hundred years ago, with even some of the wooden parts even smell musty. However, the inside decorations of both manors are quite similar, focusing on a low-key and ordinary aesthetic. In the room, Mrs. Chandler was sitting on the sofa with a sad face and sorrowful eyes. Compared to when she was in front of the camera, she seems to be more than twenty years older now, and the necklace she often wears around her neck has disappeared. 
Madam, what did Oswald exactly do to you? Did he steal your necklace? An old housekeeper asked standing before Mrs. Chandler, his eyes filled with sadness and anger. Even if you don't tell me, I can guess that Penguin wants to use you as his revenge tool. He has no idea what that necklace means to you. He's just a shameful thug, a robber, a murderer. He has damaged the reputation of the Cobblepot family. We cannot let him manipulate us. Enough. Mrs. Chandler suddenly became agitated. What can I do? Your curses won't change anything. Oswald's decisions have never changed. When he came to me, I had no other choice. I apologize, madam, for my outburst. The old butler sighed. I'm tired. You may leave now. Mrs. Chandler closed her eyes, her voice calm. Soon, the sound of the door closing echoed through the room. The old butler stands silently at the doorway for a while before finally walking away. Wait. Not long after, Mrs. Chandler suddenly came running out and stopped him. What do you need, madam? The old butler immediately bowed and asked. I have thought about what you said earlier, and you're right. We cannot let the penguin manipulate us. Mrs. Chandler places a hand on the old butler's shoulder, determination on her face. Arrange a car and a driver for me immediately. I'm going to the GCPD to seek help from Commissioner Gordon. Upon hearing her decision, the old butler becomes excited and quickly turns around to make the necessary arrangements. Not long after, the old butler began to feel that something was off. The madam had a look of worry earlier. How did her mood change so quickly? And I didn't hear the sound of the door opening just now. Most importantly, Mrs. Chandler's face seemed younger. The more the old butler thought about it, the more he felt that something was wrong. When he quickly turned around to check, there was no trace of Mrs. Chandler in the hallway, and there was also no sound when the door was opened and closed. Madam, with a loud bang, the old butler hurriedly rushed back into the room. Mrs. Chandler was startled by the sudden return of the old butler. She was about to scold him when her attention was drawn to something on his left shoulder. What is that on your left shoulder? Mrs. Chandler asked curiously. Hearing her question, the old butler instinctively turned his head to look. There, a white card was tucked into his collar. Trembling, the old butler took the card off. On the card were written a few lines, with a cartoon head drawn in the bottom right corner. If twenty multiplied by three equals four, then I will visit at a non-existent time. When Mars has passed its tenth day and night, following the guidance of Caesar, I shall come to claim the blood-stained egg. Sincerely, Phantom Thief. Author's Note. Guys, if we reach 500 Power Stone or someone solved or deciphered this recent notice, I will post three chapters tomorrow. This notice is quite difficult, especially the first line. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 8.